Awesome. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I mean, perhaps just to get started, maybe we can do like very quick intros, kind of 30 seconds or so. Uh, I know that uh, Simba and Achen, you just uh, spoke, but for those who are joining, uh, might be helpful. So uh, Achen, why don't we start with you? All right, sure. So um, like I said, I'm a data architect at Scribble Data. Uh, we are a feature store company. Um, we help uh, companies take data and, uh, you know, get decisions out of those. And we do that by building uh, sub ML um, uh, apps uh, on our feature store. Got it. Uh, Simba, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, hey, I'm Simba uh, again. Hi, <laughs> uh, co-founder and CEO of FeatureForm. And uh, yeah, I come from a practitioner background, so I know what it's like and why you would need a feature store. Awesome. Uh, Stefan? Cool. Yeah. Uh, so Stefan Kraftik. So I've been, uh, I guess, machine learning data science kind of area for the last decade. And most, most recently, I was at Stitrix for the last six years leading the model lifecycle team. So I've done a, a lot of build versus buy. So maybe I'll provide the contrarian view for you, uh, Jim, to keep this panel balanced. Awesome. And Fabio? Hi, everybody. I'm Fabio. I work at Upsox. Uh, I lead the engineering team at Opsworks and, you know, I've been working with a lot of our users and customers over time. So seeing both sides as a vendor and also as a user, uh, as, uh, you know, features to users. Cool. Okay. So let's dive in now. Um, you know, it's funny in, in preparing for, uh, this panel with Jim, I think one of the questions I asked was like, okay, do we need to level set? Like, do we need to talk through like, what is a feature store? And he said like, no, 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 no. Like everybody is going to like, know what a feature store is. Um, and to me, honestly, like that is, that is like a big accomplishment, uh, with regards to ML ops progress, because, um, I don't think I could say that even, you know, five to six uh, months ago, like, let alone like, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, but still, I think, you know, there are different interpretations of, of, you know, what is a feature store? So, so I'd love to get started by discussing, like, how is a feature store different than a database? Um, and should feature stores integrate with other databases and other, uh, data management systems? So, uh, Simba, do you want to get us started? Sure. Um, I'd actually say most people have heard what a feature store is. I bet you if you had everyone here define a feature store, you would end up with 15 different definitions. Um, and the reason for that is there's a lot of different takes on the problem because if you look around all, all the feature stores that exist, um, you'll find that most of them were built in parallel to solve similar problems, but by different people who actually weren't communicating because at the time we didn't really have a term. We weren't like, oh, we're all building feature stores together. And so um, I think to answer the question, like the difference between a feature store and a database, I think I, I, there's kind of two problems to be solved. There's like the compute problem, like being able to handle streaming data, low latency serving, all that stuff. And there's kind of the life cycle problem, the organizational problem. And I think that some companies try to take on both, in which case they kind of look like a database that is aware of the feature lifecycle. Um, in our take, like we just completely push off all the compute work and kind of act as an orchestrator plus metadata. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's a right way to do it. I just think that it is something that you have to think about as you're looking at and deciding how you're going to architect your feature store. If you want to create a separation of concerns or if you feel like they both should be kind of solved in one kind of heavier platform. Maybe kind of piggybacking off of that, like what do you think are the advantages and, and uh, disadvantages of having, you know, such separation of concerns and others feel free to chime in with your point of view too. So I think this is the, the value of the separation of concerns. I think that the problem to be solved for most companies is not, hey, like Spark sucks. Mm -hmm. The problem to be solved is, hey, we have 20 data scientists. We have 400 untitled notebooks each in each of their uh, laptops. Um, we're copying and pasting stuff on Slack. We have a Google Doc of useful SQL snippets. Um, we keep track of things in a spreadsheet of what's in production. 
like that's the problem that I'm kind of seeing and that I'm really kind of uh, sensitive to and trying to solve. And you can solve that without having to replace the databases uh, underneath it. You can kind of just act as an application layer to the infrastructure layer. So I think that's kind of the, the, the pitch, the value of, of creating the, the separation of concerns. I, I think I, I think I agree on that. Like I think there is, um, we often get like as a vendor, like that, that kind of questions, especially at the beginning of like, you know, how, how are you guys different from like a data warehouse, for instance, and stuff like that, right? So from our perspective, right, the data warehouse can be one component of the feature store. There are many more and, you know, a lot of the, Feature lifecycle management is, is a key part of the of the uh, of the feature store, and you know, be able to kind of augment the data that is in the data warehouse to be able to you know, from our perspective, enable like online use cases and like real time low latency use cases that did, you know traditionally data warehouse don't don't, don't support and to be able to kind of deliver those 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 use cases as well uh, in a single platform that becomes uh, becomes a big uh, a big win for for data scientists and so on. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, like for me from first principles perspective, you know, a feature store is kind of a superset of a database, right? And kind of get alluding to what Simba kind of said, you you have you, you have to store data somewhere. So in that sense, that you can use a database for that, right? But then you have all this other metadata, lifecycle management and processes. In which case, then it really kind of depends on your 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 um, uh, uh, how high level of a definition or kind of you know concentric circles of of scope you want to kind of define as a feature store. Uh, and so then that relates to how it integrates with our data management system so lineage data quality etc right so I'd like to uh, give an orthogonal view here right so a lot of our customers are um, customers uh, I mean they they don't have even one data scientist right so they have they probably have someone who's looking at some data data engineering but they don't they don't they don't talk about features they don't talk about models right but they still have a lot of data that they want to use, that they want to leverage. So um, think about uh, fintech uh, folks, uh, you know, uh, who, 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 are, who, are, who are probably five, six years old. So they have a lot of data, right? They, they do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, money transactions, um, but uh, they haven't started building their, their models yet. They haven't started doing all of this, this data pipelining work. And uh, um, they have a lot of, um, uh, so the kinds of problems that they want to solve are, you know, humans making decisions on the data that they have, right? And which means that this data needs to be uh, processed, managed, um, transformed in the same ways that you would do when you're building your your ML models. You know, when you're building your your ML systems, which means that you you need to have you know lineage. You need to have guarantees on okay, uh, you know, this data set is updated every hour, and you can trust that it's that it's it's you know transformed the right way. Um, so, um, so, so when you talk about feature stores for them, right? They uh, they may just want their data delivered into a, a SQL uh, database that they have, or they may want it dumped into you know an S3 store. Uh, but when they when they think about a, a feature store, they are they are more concerned on on this on the feature than the store, right? So, so the, 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 these two aspects: there's the the feature management, and then there's the store, right? So. They are like, okay, you know, we don't want to kind of integrate with anything else. Uh, give us something that would kind of talk to our stores and uh, you know help us manage um, uh, you know this 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 life cycle of, of features, but not from an ML point of view. Um, I hope that's coming across. Yeah. Yeah. So so I mean, it seems like uh, what people are suggesting is that like a feature store may be a database, but but that is that is uh, kind of not enough. Uh, there there are these additional capabilities that you would want on top of a, a database, um, whether it is some of the uh, kind of like workflow oriented uh, features um, or or kind of additional like uh, performance related capabilities. Um, so, so I think like perhaps we can agree though that like a feature store ought to be integrated into the rest of your data infrastructure and that like presumably like a feature store is not going to be like the only database that, you know, a company ever uses. Um, so one thing that I think we, we see more and more right now is that like there are these two data stacks that are emerging, uh, one that often like kind of hinges upon like the cloud data warehouse. Um, and that like frequently powers analytics, BI reporting, et cetera. Um, 
Another that might really hinge upon the, the, the feature store and that supports the development of models and ultimately ML-driven applications. Um, do you think there are ways for feature stores to kind of better unify these stacks? Since it seems like if they continue to grow independently, it'll just breed more complexity. Uh, Fabio, do you, do you want to get us started? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's actually, I think that's actually a very interesting point, right? To, um, you know, features still don't, don't exist in isolation, right? They, 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 obviously, they obviously need the source of data coming, you know, from data warehouse is one, you know, you also have streams, you also have data lakes and, and system of records and so on and so forth. Um, our approach as, as, as a platform, as Opsworx, is, is to be able to kind of integrate both worlds, right? You have to try to bridge the, the, the Python ecosystem and whether it's like, you know, all the model building frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on and so forth with the, with the underlying data. And, and the way we approach this problem is, is by exposing a Python API to, 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 to the users, so allowing users to kind of, you know, uh, allowing data scientists to be able to write their Python code like, like they were, you know, dealing with like a small set of data, but under the hood, we just take that uh, like computation, we transpile it to a SQL and we run it on the different data sources, whether it's a, you know, data warehouse like Snowflake or BigQuery or anything like this, or whether it's something stored on S3. And then we take that, we unify everything and give it back as a Pandas data frame. So from our perspective, coming back, I think there's definitely like this divergence going on. Uh, I think the feature store is a, is a good uh, place for bridging the gap between what's what's the what's the like uh, data science world and what is like the data analytics world. And you, as a feature store, at least from from our perspective, that's it's allowing you to kind of announce what's the data warehouse. Like so, a lot of a lot of times, like our customers come in and say, okay, well, you know, I have all my data there, but then you know, when I'm building a model, I want to see all the history, right? So I then. I don't necessarily want to keep the history, the entire historical data on data warehouse because it becomes too expensive. So I want to dump in something a little bit cheaper, like um, like an S3 bucket or something like this. But I want to be able to manage in a, in a single in a single way. So from that perspective, uh, you need to be able to 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 be flexible and be able to accommodate all these kind of use cases and so on. I I wouldn't say that like a feature store is a superset of a database. Like in our case we don't even store data, um, like we store metadata. So I think that like the analogy I like to think of is like, you wouldn't call like Terraform as like a whole new player in the cloud space. It's like a whole different problem, which is the, the kind of maintaining, um, iterating on your infrastructure, kind of infrastructure as code. Um, so it's life cycle problem. So I guess I would, I have a different take here in that I just, think they're just completely tangential. I mean, like as an example, we charge per seat, which if you go to any like compute or database, we don't, they don't charge per seat. So when I look at kind of what's happening in the data space um, and, and other databases and other kind of people in the ecosystem, I just see it as a tangential issue, which is people trying to solve a whole different problem, um, whether that be, um, you know, making it easy to, to handle tons of data, making it easy to handle streaming data, et cetera, but it's not a feature lifecycle problem. That they're trying to solve. Maybe, maybe kind of like clarifying the distinction though. I think uh, there, there, there are times at which we've talked about feature stores. There are times where we've talked about kind of like feature management systems more, more broadly. Like, do you believe therefore that kind of the, the feature store and the set of capabilities that you just outlined ought to uh, like integrate with other databases? Like, uh, or our feature store is kind of totally separate. I think they should integrate. And that's like the whole virtual feature store concept we came up with is kind of trying to give a name to that idea of, um, it, they're just two parallel problems, two different axes you wanna solve. I, I, do have a, I do have a comment on, on, on the virtual feature store to be honest a little bit. On, from, from my perspective, like, and again, that's just something, you know, I mean, you know, we obviously the, every customer is different. Every every use case is different. Like, um, the tendency is though, like, especially if you start building a large, like, um, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of people start with, okay, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna build all my features in, as a as a table in data warehouse, right? I don't even care about like feature store. I don't even care about like my data management. Just gonna dump everything there, right? Um, then then those tables start, start to grow, and then you start having to to backfill data, and then you have to start to you know add additional features and 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 stuff like, um. 
you start start basically managing that table as it was kind of a feature store uh, and 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 so on and so forth. And then that that's where they kind of they look like they they look at like how to augment that um that like you know table on the data warehouse with 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 additional capabilities allow the track like history and the changes and you know allow to backfill data and so on and so forth. Um, and you know one big component um, from, from at least for our users is you know. Uh, you know, the bill in the data warehouse at the end of the day uh, uh, grows quite quite a lot if you keep a lot of history if you start if you start like querying back and doing like point in time joins start joining up tons of tables um, looking back a lot in the history and stuff like that so uh, all these things then becomes becomes a, like a part, point of concern where it makes sense to you know so upload some of the data outside the, 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 the data warehouse use the data warehouse as a source of truth and then you know augment this transform the features and, and store them somewhere somewhere else. But again, that's that's two different approaches. I can see I can see a simple point. Um, just want to make you know a different a different argument there. I mean, I guess to Sarah's original uh, question on like the SQL centric versus Python, I think you know uh, to that point, the the only way that you can make the two worlds coexist is by sharing data. So in which case that data needs to live somewhere, right? And so in which case you do need to store it. Uh, otherwise, you know if. I'm pretty sure uh, you can describe anything in Python that you can do in SQL. So my hope is that everyone just moves to Python and so then SQL goes away. But um, otherwise, uh, I think, yeah, features are a superset of anything that you do with metrics. So uh, it is true, at least it was the case in Stitch Fix, that like, you know, uh, metrics can be features, but not all features are used as metrics. So in which case, uh, it, it potentially could be a one-way relationship where you are just kind of, to your point, um, Fabio, is that rather than things in the data warehouse being the source, you then push them into the feature store for people to use in features and then uh you know uh, people can then model and, and things live on that way yeah yeah i i i think it's interesting also to, to perhaps like ask the question that like uh, in the situation that that you described fabio where where kind of you outgrow the data warehouse as as a back end for your feature store um it is kind of the right solution to uh, build a database or adopt a database that is that is kind of like purpose built and tightly coupled to your additional feature store capabilities and the workload things that Simba discussed. Um, or, you know, is, is the real answer just like not the cloud data warehouse, but perhaps some other database uh, uh, put differently? Like, uh, do you believe that you need a database that it is purpose built to be, you know, the back end for your feature store to be the store for features. But at this at this also we don't have like a like a general a, like a like a purpose built right. Like from from our perspective, it's it's basically Udify Apache Udifies on on S three bucket. That that's the that's the the, the 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 at least for the for the offline um, what we call offline feature store. So for mostly batch use cases and so on. There's there's one additional one additional point that, that that's not kind of part of this conversation, right? We, what do we do with the online data, right? How do we how do we handle data that needs to be fetched, yeah. like with uh, you know millisecond latency, but also how do we handle data that needs to be refreshed with that that level of latency, right? So if if you have data on you know, traditional data warehouse and stuff like this, that 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 kind of that kind of uh, database doesn't doesn't really support these use cases. So you need to at least move it out uh, of the data warehouse, make it available somewhere, at least somewhere else where for, for that for that to be to be to be queryable by models and to be to be able actually uh, like usable by, by by models. So the online part is also like a critical component, I think, of like how you think about feature store, how you think about patterns and building models and, and delivering those models. Yeah. I think one reason the feature life cycle is hard is because like uh, Fabio was saying, um, data like kind of is scattered like a feature doesn't exist in one place the feature exists in s3 exists in snowflake it exists across a ton of queries that are maybe orchestrated by airflow exists in redis for online serving and it's your job as a data scientist to kind of um make all those things work together um and keep them in sync so i think that um it's correct but you can't just use a data warehouse for everything um and so you do need that in a lot of different places i think then the question becomes do you want to build a better purpose-built redis or do you want to just use Redis or a purpose built Snowflake or just use Snowflake or whatever? So I think the I think we're saying the same thing. I think one difference is we decided not to build anything to build a better Snowflake, build a better Redis. We decided to just use what's out there and let those vendors solve their problems. And we'll just kind of piggyback on that. 
I think one thing that that has arisen in this discussion uh, now is is kind of the the uh, differences uh, in the requirements for feature management uh, when you're building online versus offline ML systems. I'm I'm curious to kind of get uh, the panelists' take on these. Uh, how do you how do you kind of see the difference in both architecture and technical requirements for these? And then relatedly, you know, should we be implementing features um, at least twice, um, or you know, only once? Uh, Stefan, do you want to kick sure. that off? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, good question. I think you know, part of it. I mean, in terms of the use cases, right? So with with offline versus online, you kind of have different use cases. So with offline, not only uh, we doing okay, offline prediction, but you're also trying to surface uh, and facilitate offline development. So that is, you know, adding features, so backfilling things, and, you know, training models. You know, you're tweaking feature sets and and, and things as you're developing, uh, then potentially predicting with them. And then on, on the online case, it's um, uh, the the view of features that you need is pretty much only the latest features. Whereas in the offline case, you need kind of all, all points in time because that's, you know, you're going to create your training data from it. So I think, you know, those with those two kind of main use cases in mind, like for me, the, the main, uh, you know, requirements differences is one, you know, uh, with online, you're only really managing the latest features. So that can, it can actually be simpler uh, than on the offline side. Uh, you potentially also manage different SLAs. So then like, so then there's kind of some people view uh, the online store as a cache of kind of the latest view of the offline store is kind of one way to, to think about it. And so then they use a different technology to store it. So they're not going to S3, for instance, which the offline store does, but maybe, you know, it goes to Redis, as kind of simple saying. And then uh, to, to your latter, uh, uh, I guess, point was on, on kind of def definitions. So invariably then uh, through the SLAs and when you get updates, like then there's the whole management and the process management of like, well, how do you update features? How do you add them? Do you ideally in a golden world you can write a feature once and it runs everywhere? So you know something like you know Apache Beam from Google is kind of meant to meant to kind of help with this, right? Uh, where you write a write a transform once and it can run in batch and streaming. You don't have to manage it, but I think you know uh, uh, in, in most realities people end up at least uh, implementing things twice. So one in Spark and then one in Flink. Um, uh, and so uh, those are at least the, the three main points for me. Otherwise, you know versioning and lineage and data quality, I think are all the same. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's just uh, mainly driven by the different use cases as to like how the different management kind of uh, needs differ. Uh, there, there's a related question from the audience, uh, which is, you know, if you rely on existing data infrastructure, uh, uh, how do you think about the need for two different pipelines, one to support batch backfill and one to support online streaming computation? Uh, so, so certainly related to yeah. your no, response, no. but... Not an easy, not an easy question to answer. Um, I think, yeah, like if you've been around and you've been doing machine learning for a while, you invariably have like calcified kind of infrastructure. You just, you, the only way is to push things into a pipe into Kafka and then, you know, push things other way. Uh, if you don't have CDC on a database, like, you know, you have to do a bunch of, you know, Lambda architecture to kind of join things up uh, uh, at the end. So I think, uh, 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 yeah, happy for the other panelists to jump in to see what they've seen, but it, it, yeah, like it's not, um, there's no, no simple answer there. It, it, invariably, you probably end up in building two things. Yeah, yeah I, agree. I mean, um, yep, sorry, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I agree uh, in that, um, you know, yeah, I mean, there's, so online and real time kind of are their own beasts, right? You need to have a lot of pieces in place to make sure that you can trust uh, the data that you have online with uh, what you're building offline. So, you know, if, even if we don't look at something like, um, even if we don't look at ML, right? If we don't, if we don't look at uh, features that you need for doing inference on your model, let's say you know you you have some data that you're uh, that's powering a a dashboard, right? Um, uh, you can you can build offline snapshots of you know everything up till let's say the past hour, and then if you want your dashboard to reflect what's correct point in time as of as of now you need to have something that kind of updates the delta from from the past hour right um so i mean that it, it's painful and and you you need to have then two sets of processes that are doing that aggregation over the past uh, window up to the last hour and then something for the hour right and these are definitely different code bases um and you know sometimes different uh, logic sometimes different conditions in uh, filtering and uh, joining all of this together so 
it's it's painful. Um, mm. I, I I don't know what the easy solution is. I, I think um, a lot. Of, I think I I'm pretty sure Oxford says this. I know we do it, but um, kind of having a single um, feature definition for uh, both streaming and and kind of handling back to all that stuff. I think is kind of one of the promises of a feature store, like having one unified definition. I think the problem with a lot of this is that there's a, a different problem, which is kind of unifying streaming and batch, which gets associated with feature stores a lot because the place where you tend to do that quite a bit is in machine learning. So it gets associated with feature stores, um, but it's kind of a different problem to be solved. And I think one way to do it is to solve it with the feature store. We've like managed to solve it, probably not as good as could be done if we owned everything, um, but uh, or kind of hoping for the vendors. I feel like if you look at what Databricks, Snowflake, and some startups like Decodable are doing, they're kind of trying to uh, bridge that gap for us. So we're kind of waiting on them <laughs> to, to solve this streaming versus batch problem once and for all. Yeah, from, from, from my perspective, right, I think I think, I think think Stefan was mentioning earlier at the beginning, I think the, 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 the way we see it is that the, the online problem is actually two different problems from, from, from our perspective. One is like retrieving the data, right? And then, you know, the retrieving data as a given set of SLA and you need to respect that. Um, then the question is like, how do you actually update that data, right? And depending on whether you have some daily batches that need to be updated, so you might have recompute everything once a day and then upload it, then, you know, that's, that, that makes it more easy to, to kind of keep the same feature definition across batch and, 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 and online, right? On the other hand, if you have like if you have a streaming um, a streaming situation that that you need to update the data uh, in a in a in a streaming fashion on the online feature store, then you need um, to have some yeah some lambda architecture in place that allows you to basically take the stream and also uh, every now and then dump it, dump it on the on, on, on the offline feature store. That's 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 the way that's the way kind of we we, we see you know. Um, Having the same feature definition, and and the reason I think the single feature definition is is, is quite critical is that if you start having multiple feature definition, if you start having multiple features, then it becomes a really challenging to keep to keep in sync what's your model you've trained on and what's the the inference that you're you're, you're doing on right. Then it becomes really really challenging, and then at that point you're basically back at the same state that you were at the beginning, where you have a bunch of data in data warehouse, you have a bunch of data on on on, on online features, so whether it's you know, already it's RunDB or any other Cassandra or anything like that, and and you know you have to you have to make sure that they are in sync essentially. So, so there was a follow up question, uh, like, should we be pushing for solutions that require us to only write features once? Uh, I think, like, implicitly, many of you suggested that yes, we should. Um, uh, I think uh, some of these kind of like design decisions though probably hinge upon like uh, for whom you are trying to build a feature store and what their goals are. Uh, so I'm, I'm certainly curious to, to kind of hear the panelists take on this both more globally, like uh, are we building for uh, model developers, ML practitioners, those, those that are building uh, models and ML driven applications or are we building for like data platform um, engineers? Um, and then, you know, even perhaps using that example, uh, like why, why do these things matter? And, and do the interests of those stakeholders diverge in a way that forces you to, to you know, make careful design decisions? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Simba. Yeah. What I've seen is, um, it's, it's really interesting you mentioned this because I, I noticed this a lot where data scientists kind of hate lots of MLOps tools and then platform engineers <laughs> kind of shove them down their throat anyway. And so I think it's really important for us, um, especially vendors, to really be sensitive to like what data scientists actually want to be doing, what they want to use, and focusing on their problems too. Very different problems to be solved based on who you're talking about. A VP is thinking about different things from a platform person, from a data scientist. And it is kind of our job to make sure that everyone's happy as much as possible. So um, I do think that we think of building for the data scientist, and um, but our the person who picks us and the person who ends up buying us and people who pay for feature form is almost always on the platform team. Yeah, I think I think I, I agree with Simba here. Like every every successful implementation we've done uh, of Opsorx is because data scientists are happy using Opsorx. Um, if you, if you don't get data scientists happy, 
uh, someone might be willing to pay, but then you know ultimately nobody's gonna just build on. They will try to find some of the solutions and so on, right? So it, it's really important from 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 a, from a feature store perspective to, that you know you serve um, your your data scientists to be able to you know to be productive and 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 to be happy essentially. That that's that's the that's the ultimate goal. Uh, um, I have a orthogonal view here then. <laughs> so the, mm -hmm. the folks who buy uh, Scribble's enriched platform the most are basically, um, you know, data, I'm um, sorry, business analysts, business stakeholders, product users, managers, right? Because their, um, their use cases, their questions are always, how do I make use of this data? It's not how do I build a model? It's not um, how do I... Uh, build my features better. No, it's it's. A, I have this decision to make every day when I wake up in the morning. How do I do that with my data? Right. So that's the question that they're asking, um, and and uh, so yeah, that that's different from from what uh, both uh, Simba and Fabio mentioned. Yeah. Coming from Stitch Stitch Fix, our, our ethos was you know we're, we're trying to build for you know tools for data science to be self service. It's great great to hear that that you know the self service uh, uh, thinking I think is you know extending uh, beyond that. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of I guess uh, you know, yeah, the ultimate goal for us was to try to design a single API, but that wasn't always the case because I mean, if you have systems like say Spark and Flink, they don't speak the same SQL dialect, so someone needs to invariably manage things. Maybe they do overlap. Now there are you know systems and teams who are trying to you know make that, but then. Uh, SQL doesn't do everything, so then you then bring in Python. So then, invariably, you are kind of, I guess, uh, to the original question: Should you be pushing for one or two? I think ideally you shoot for one, but it really depends on your kind of SLA and use case. Since I do think, um, uh, you know, in some instances you can get by with with one definition if you do it for and and you're writing SQL, which is very, I think, uh, I think we can largely all agree that's mostly accessible to 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 in data scientists. I think I, I would pose more of the question is actually yeah. Uh, uh, is, is is SQL or, or Python going to win out as the ultimate kind of API uh, for people to write features? That's kind of that, that's the thing that's on my mind when I'm kind of actually thinking <laughs> of uh, you know who we're designing things for. Uh, so we're going to have to wrap in just one second, but I think that is a great question to to end the panel. Uh, this is obviously like a very contentious question. Uh, certainly, I feel like every every couple of months on Twitter at conferences, et cetera, you hear like this heated battle between like SQL enthusiasts and Python enthusiasts. So I'd love to hear any hot takes before we wrap. I, I, I think, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, sorry, go ahead. I said, yeah, one second. Neither of them are going away, so you just have to be, play nice with, with both. <laughs> both. Art is going to still exist too. Like, doesn't matter what we care, what we think. Notebooks too. We're going to be, people are going to want to try deployment and production. Like, this stuff is going to continue to happen for many years to come. So you can say whatever you want and, you know, be a, a fundamentalist about something, but it's not going away. Yeah, so SQL is being used for more and more uh, things that people want to do, but then there's always things that you can't do and that you have to go back and uh, use something. I mean, you have to use a, a more expressive language, so it, they're not going away. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I guess my, my hot take is, I think, you know, ultimately, I think Python, especially there is, there's works on, you know, uh, essentially making it uh, easy enough for people who I think you know SQL people pick up SQL because it's you know pretty you know readable but I want to say you know if you're coming from a spreadsheet I want to say Python if you can simplify it might, it might you know uh, be a, a, a easy easier kind of switch rather than than writing SQL but again to a simplest point you know the SQL is very established it's not going away uh, I'm likely going to have to uh, you know support both ecosystems but um, you know my hope is that you know, as a developer I can we can build an experience where people don't have to switch too much if they don't have to and then it's very then segmented by end user and end use case. Yeah, that, that that's that's also our philosophy, right? Be able to, to support the people and with the with the with the tools they, they, they want to use. And if data scientists want to use Python, then uh, we need to provide a way for them to to to, to be able to like uh, you know use Python all the way, um, build features, deploy features, and and so on and so forth. So, but again, I, I I as well think that SQL it's not going to disappear. Uh, it's just a matter of like I got the Python ecosystem. Welcome uh, to be able to access like wider uh, wide wide array of data and features. Awesome. 
Well, I think we are a little bit over time, so I'm going to wrap with that. But thank you so much for, for the interesting responses. I think this this brings it back to what Simba was saying before, which is we have a lot of a lot of uh, knowledge gleaned on feature stores, but still lack kind of a common definition and and for good reasons. There, there's still a lot of heterogeneity in terms of what teams do and how they think.